Hi, my name is Kathleen Krim, and I'm one of the Gaspin board members. I am now going to introduce our next speaker, Maria Karimbakis. Maria is a registered dietitian and board certified in nutrition support who received her Bachelor of Science from the University of Vermont and completed her dietetic internship at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. She has been providing clinical care and education to short bowel consumers for over 20 years and worked at the Nutritional Research, Research Center, the first intestinal rehabil rehabilitation program. Maria has co-authored several abstracts, papers, and book chapters on the subject of diet and short bowel syndrome. She co-authored Thrive Rx's Maximize Health Program, now Optum Intestinal Rehab Program. Maria? Thank you so much, Kathleen. And Jessica, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. I enjoyed it very much. Um, okay, so let's get going here. Let me just make sure I can advance my slides. Okay, um, in terms of disclosures, I have nothing to disclose. Okay, so today's objectives are to define short bowel syndrome, discuss causes and consequences and understand factors that um, determine severity, and to discuss intestinal rehabilitation and the role of these uh, medical management strategies in short bowel treatment. So just uh, to, by way of review, uh, let's just talk about what is short bowel syndrome. Um, it's a specific type of intestinal failure that occurs because of the loss of significant portion of the small bowel's absorptive area. It was initially defined as having less than 200 centimeters or six and a half feet of jejunum ileum in continuity after bowel resection, keeping in mind that the normal length of intestine is between 12 and 20 feet. Um, or 365 to 700 centimeters. Um, it's currently defined as the failure of the intestine to adequately meet the nutrient and fluid requirements of the individual. And that shift is really because this uh, rigidity of bowel length um, has proved to be just that, a little bit too rigid. Um, it really needs to be about what is happening clinically with the patient in terms of their um, weight and nutrition status. Um, as it relates to their small bowel length. And, and technically, a patient without a colon does not have short bowel syndrome, but can have uh, severe compromise in terms of fluid um, and electrolytes. Uh, short bowel is the most common type of chronic intestinal failure, and it can occur in both adults and children. So depending on the anatomy of the remnant bowel, there are three categories. Um, that uh, short bowel is identified by. So there are those uh, that have an NJ genostomy. Uh, these are patients with no colon incontinuity. So they have an ostomy in place. Um, and uh, technically it could be uh, J genostomy and ileostomy, but no colon intact. Uh, there's the jejunocolic anastomosis. So uh, these are patients with um, no ileocecal valve in part of their colon incontinuity. Technically, these patients could have an ostomy as well, um, ending you know, as a colostomy. And then there's the jejunal ileal anastomosis. So uh, these patients have both their ileocecal valve um, and their entire colon incontinuity. In terms of causes of short bowel, um, it can be the result of extensive small bowel resection or due to a functional defect. Um, extensive small bowel resection can be the result of a number of conditions, um, such as infarction of the mesenteric vessels, which is when you know, the, the blood supply to the um, mesenteric artery is, is compromised, uh, due to intestinal volvulus, which we tend to see more in children than adults, but we do see it in adults. Um, abdominal trauma, so things like car accidents, gunshot wounds, um, malignancy, um, congenital abnormalities, and for those with, that um, have repeated resections due to Crohn's disease, uh, they certainly can um, end up with short bowel syndrome. Uh, a functional defect is seen in individuals with radiation enteritis um, and severe inflammatory bowel de disease. So in the case of functional defect, uh, the patient's not necessarily missing large portions of small bowel, um, but what bowel remains is damaged and it's not functioning as it should. So this is really why we've, as I mentioned briefly, why we moved away from defining short bowel by a specific remaining bowel length and continue to now define short bowel as the 
failure of the intestine to adequately meet the nutrient and fluid requirements of the individual. So diarrhea is the primary consequence of short bowel, uh, leading to major fluid and nutrient losses, um, incomplete digestion and absorption of food. When left untreated, uh, dehydration, electrolyte abnormalities, vitamin and mineral deficiencies, and progressive weight loss and malnutrition can occur. So there's usually a need for nutrition support to prevent dehydration, stabilize electrolytes, and avoid weight loss, or in, in many cases, restore weight, um, and to provide vitamins and minerals. Um, but the severity of the short bowel is determined by a few factors. So let's, let's take a look at those. Okay, so it's imperative to know as much as possible about the remaining bowel. And specifically, we want to focus on the length, the location, the function, and the adaptation of the remaining bowel. So for in terms of length, um, since, as I previously mentioned, there's a large range in normal small bowel length, again, that being 12 to 20 feet or 365 to 700 centimeters, it's essential that we focus on the small, the small bowel length remaining following a resection rather than the length of small bowel removed. Um, and often, you know, we're hunting through operative reports to get that information um, because it can tell us just so very much. Uh, and more specifically, um, many predictions can be made as to how much IV nutrition support um, will be needed over time based on the length of the remaining small bowel and the presence or the absence of colon. So research and clinical experiences um, has helped in determining that to reduce or eliminate the need for long-term PN, adult patients need a minimum of 60 to 90 centimeters of jejunum ileum in, in place with a portion of colon or greater than 150 centimeters of jejunum ileum alone if no colon is present. And so looking at length is just the starting place. Uh, next, we need to look at the location of the remaining bowel. So what part of the small intestine remains intact? In general, um, a jejunal resection is better tolerated than an ileal resection um, since the ileum adapts and can assume the absorptive functions of the missing jejunum, um, which makes for less compromise. Um, but there are functions that are unique to the ileum. For example, absorption of bile salts that are needed for fat digestion. Uh, as well as the absorption of vitamin B12 that cannot be assumed by the jejunum. So, you know, that, that being a, a huge piece here in terms of knowing what part of the small bowel remains. And then the next question uh, to, to look at is, does the patient have a colon or not? Uh, this will help to determine how well a patient will absorb fluid and electrolytes, um, but the colon also plays a very unique role for patients with short bowel. Um, bacteria within the colon ferment malabsorbed carbohydrates into short chain fatty acids, um, which can then be utilized for energy. So the presence of colon is typically a very good predictor of a more favorable outcome and less dependency on parenteral support. Uh, so we, we're really, you know, again, combing that operative report in hopes that we're, we're going to find a good portion of, of colon present. And then also determining if, il if there's an ileocecal valve present. So the ileocecal valve sits at the junction of the small bowel and first part of the colon um, or the cecum. And I like to think of it as the gatekeeper, so to speak, uh, controlling the passage of contents from the small bowel to the large bowel, but also preventing the reflux of large intestine contents back from the colon into the small bowel and most specifically bacteria. And then next, we want to look at the function of the remaining bowel. Uh, so is the remaining bowel healthy? If short bowel was caused by, you know, infarction or trauma, volvulus, um, what remains for small bowel is typically healthy. Whereas those with underlying inflammatory bowel disease, although they're going to have the resection in order to remove the area of inflammatory bowel disease, uh, there's always a chance that the Crohn's disease isn't completely removed, can't be completely removed, or may come back. Um, so that um, makes uh, sometimes for a different circumstance for patients. Uh, and for those that have had radiation to their um, intestinal area, uh, the degree to which it's damaged um, is going to, of course, affect the function. 
So again, you may be looking at someone in these circumstances with more bowel remaining, but what remains is not functioning. Uh, and again, why we moved away from that very strict definition of short bowel. And then finally, adaptation of the remaining bowel. So to what extent has the remaining bowel compensated for the missing portion? And how well does the remaining bowel absorb nutrients and fluid? So intestinal adaptation plays a key role uh, in the successful management of these patients. Um, and it's defined by the, it's the process by which the bowel attempts to increase uh, fluid and nutrient absorption to the level where it was prior to resection. Um, now, the best way to, to look at it is, you know, it's characterized by elongation and dilation of the rem remnant bowel. If we had the opportunity to look under a microscope um, at those changes, um, but since, of course, we don't routinely have that opportunity clinically, uh, bowel adaptation is marked by really just gradual improvement in symptoms. So a decrease in diarrhea, um, improved tolerance to and better absorption of enteral nutrients. Uh, and really, in a clinical practice, um, the best measure we have into determining how well the bowel has adapted is really looking at actual food and fluid intake um, and stool and urine output records and how well the patient is able to maintain their weight on the least amount of IV nutrition. So that is, um, you know, a, a, can be a, a labor of love um, to be looking routinely at intake and output records, but very, very needed in this population of patients um, it's not just about, you know, how many calories they're eating. It's about, you know, what is, what effect are those calories and that fluid having on their bowel? Um, in addition, looking at vitamin and mineral levels, like we just talked about, um, those have to be monitored um, as, of course, this is another measure of nutritional status. And this becomes uh, increasingly important as IV nutrition is weaned, um, you know, in determining how well through you know, oral diet and supplementation, uh, patients with short bowel are able to maintain uh, normal levels of these um, micronutrients. So uh, just to further the point of you know, the importance of checking these uh, at baseline and along the way, um, both on IV nutrition to be sure you're correcting deficiencies from the get-go and then ongoing as well, especially when you begin weaning. And the process of bowel adaptation begins almost immediately following extensive resection, um, but it, it can be maximized uh, for up to two plus years. Uh, so it's important to really, uh, if you can, uh, intervene soon after the resection um, in order to, to make the most of this adaptation phase. Now, uh, Short bowel patients are often on a combination of nutrition therapies. Uh, the focus of diet therapy and enteral nutrition um, is to manipulate food and fluid selections um, according to you know, the short bowel diet guidelines, which we're gonna speak about it, um, or I'm gonna speak about and discuss in, it in a couple of minutes, um, to help optimize absorption of calories, nutrients, and fluids um, through the GI tract, again, with the goal of reducing or eliminating the need for long-term IV therapy. And when we consider long-term IV therapy, we're thinking about both IV hydration and parenteral nutrition since short bowel patients are usually on a combination of both. Uh, so parenteral nutrition is the initial treatment for short bowel syndrome, but having a diagnosis of short bowel does not necessarily mean lifelong dependency on parenteral nutrition. So in patients with short bowel syndrome, chronic intestinal failure may be reversible with intestinal rehabilitation. So we're just gonna talk a little bit about the importance in the history of intestinal rehabilitation. Um, by definition, uh, intestinal rehabilitation is a process of maximizing the digestive and absorptive capacity of the remnant short bowel to improve uptake of fluid, electrolytes, and nutrients. And the goal of home IR uh, is to reduce this need for routine use of parenteral nutrition therapy and intravenous fluids. So this intestinal rehabilitation concept was researched and developed by doctors Wilmore and Byrne um, in Boston, Massachusetts back in 1993. Uh, and uh, that was at a center called the Nutritional Restart Center, which I had uh, the great uh, real honor of working at um, under Dr. Wilmore and Dr. Byrne um, back back then. 
Uh, since 2000, intestinal rehabilitation has been incorporated into care at medical centers of excellence nationwide. And you see intestinal rehabilitation both um, as standalone programs and also in conjunction with intestinal rehabilitation, I'm sorry, intestinal transplant programs to give patients the opportunity um, to rehabilitate if possible before having to take more aggressive means of, of intervention. So intestinal rehabilitation, it's a stepwise approach. It embraces diet and med medication education that's tailored to the patient's lifetime, excuse me, lifestyle and goals and safely reduces patients' dependence on IV therapy. Uh, so you'll see here that it includes PN optimization, diet education, medication management, specialized drug therapy, and surgical evaluation. And many of these steps are sort of happening in tandem. So we're gonna talk about each one. So in terms of PN optimization, so immediately following surgical resection, PN is used to aggressively replete fluid and electrolytes um, and to meet the calorie and micronutrient requirements. So this is a starting point um, for, I would pretty much have to say all short bowel patients. Um, and during this time, just like in all conditions in which we treat um, you know, a patient with nutrition support, all attempts should be made to avoid overfeeding, uh, to cycle parental nutrition as soon as possible um, over a 12 to 16 hour period. Um, education, you know, of course, when they're in the inpatient setting, the care of their central line is, is happening by the medical team um, with, of course, the focus on preventing central line complications, but educating that patient as soon as they are able to receive the information on the importance of maintaining, you know, aseptic technique and uh, preserving their line uh, to avoid central line infections um, and continuing that education uh, right through the transition to home and, and of course ongoing. And all attempts with um, you know, the parental nutrition optimization need to also include minimizing the impact on quality of life. This is a, you know, not an easy therapy to go home with. We all recognize the importance of it as a life-sustaining therapy. Um, but it is not without its challenges in terms of compromise of quality of life. So just looking at the barriers that these patients may have at home to being adherent to the therapy and, and trying to work uh, very closely with them to, to avoid some of that um, is, is so key to the success in the home. Now, in terms of, of diet education, the short bowel diet is really the cornerstone of the intestinal rehabilitation um, program. So detailed diet education uh, should be initiated as soon as possible and specifically individualized um, based on that remaining bowel anatomy that we just talked about all the pieces of that being so important. Um, diet preferences, uh, tolerance to the oral diet, and then personal goals. So just trying to you know, align the idea that the better that they can eat and tolerate the food and absorb it is going to help one, mitigate symptoms um, and, and the time that they're spending in the bathroom related to the diarrhea associated with short bowel. And then this idea that long term, this can have a significant impact, the diet can have a significant impact on reducing parental nutrition needs. So let's talk about the diet. Um, and I'm going to spend a few minutes here, um, you know, explaining the differences. So the, of course, the diet principles will remain the same, um, but extensive research has demonstrated that patients with a colon need a different percentage of nutrients than those without a colon. So as you see here in this table, um, those with a colon should consume a diet higher in carbohydrates. So you see here 50 to 60% of total calories with limited simple sugars, um, lower in fat, so 20 to 30% of total calories, um, they should limit their amount of oxalates and their meals should be divided, you know, in five to six meals per day. Um, now, as compared to those without a colon, these patients should consume a diet somewhat lower in carbohydrates, so 40 to 50 percent of total calories um, with restricted simple sugars. Uh, their diet is slightly higher in fat, 30 to 40 percent of total calories, and meals are divided in four to six per day. As you'll see, um, in both diets, the percentage of protein is the same, so 20 to 30% of total calories. Um, and, and isotonic fluids are recommended 
Uh, and isotonic fluids are, are the fluids of choice because of um, the, the fluid that surrounds the GI tract. Um, you're looking for uh, the fluids to match the, the concentration of the um, fluid that surrounds the GI tract. So you hear a lot about oral rehydration solutions and the importance of those solutions um, because they contain the right amount of sodium uh, and glucose uh, to match the fluid that surrounds the, the, the GI tract. So I'm not going to give a lot of examples of that today. If people have questions on it, I'd be more than happy to discuss that um, because I know that tends to be an area that, that people um, you know, have, have some questions on. So I'm definitely happy to answer some questions on that. But just in keeping with the, the food and uh, for a moment more, um, the patients, um, you know, I want to just focus on the differences uh, between the diets a little bit more. So, for example, with the total carbohydrates, the, the reason we recommend more total carbohydrates for those with a colon um, is because patients with a colon have typically shorter segments of small bowel than those with NJ genostomies, and typically, therefore, have higher calorie needs. So a high-carbohydrate diet can help meet those calorie needs um, through the process of colonic fermentation uh, so what's happening there is carbohydrates that are not absorbed in the small intestine uh, due to the short bowel um, actually get passed into the colon undigested and can actually be fermented uh, in the colon into short chain fatty acids and then absorbed and utilized for energy. And those without colons, this process just simply can't occur. So you can't make up for calories there. Um, so there's really not a reason then for those without a colon to push the carbohydrate calories. Um, whereas with those with a colon, we, we push quite a bit because, again, we can utilize this process of colonic fermentation and make up for um, some, of, of this, uh, some of these calories. Now, the reason less fat is recommended for those with a colon um, is because when more than 100 centimeters of ileum is resected, um, bile salts, uh, which are so important for fat absorption, are, are malabsorbed in large amounts, and eventually that bile salt pool gets depleted. So fewer bile salts are available, um, limiting the absorption of fat and fat-soluble vitamins. And so as a result of that, the malabsorption of fat causes a second problem, um, because the unabsorbed fat ends up binding up with calcium, preventing calcium from binding to dietary oxalates. Um, and then these unbound oxalates um, pass into the colon where they're reabsorbed and then excreted in the urine. So high oxalate levels in the urine over time can lead to kidney stones. So it's a whole cascade of events that can occur. Um, so there's often a focus on uh, reducing or eliminating dietary oxalates in order to avoid these calcium oxalate stones. But just as important and maybe even potentially more important is actually supplementing the diet with oral calcium uh, so that um, the calcium from the exogenous source can be available to bind up these oxalates um, and, 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 and get secreted into the, or excreted into the stool instead of getting absorbed um, into the, um, the system. Now, the reason oxalates are not restricted for somebody without a colon is none of this is happening um, for somebody without a colon. So they're at, um, I don't want to say no risk for calcium oxalate stones, but greatly, greatly reduced risk. Uh, and the other thing that I just want to say about the diet is since not all carbohydrates are created equal, um, much time needs to be spent educating patients really on those differences between, uh, for example, complex carbohydrates and simple sugars, as well as soluble versus insoluble fiber. Um, so, you know, although, you know, and I know I'm talking to, to dietitians here, um, but although they're all carbohydrates, um, complex carbohydrates and soluble fiber can contribute to increased intestinal absorption. Um, whereas simple sugars and insoluble fiber can lead to more stool volume. So this is just a, a specific area of focus um, where patients need a lot of first diet education and then reinforcement 
on this topic and you know where to identify simple sugars and and both in foods and in fluids uh, so that they're uh, you know very well aware of the negative effects of this the of the simple sugars um, for example and then distinguishing the fiber um, which you know kind of comes secondary with the education if we can get them understanding simple versus complex carbohydrates first uh, that helps quite a bit in um, reducing uh, stool output usually up front because the the sugar is it's in usually everybody's diet, uh, so it's important to be aware of, of, of the compromise that that can create. Uh, and just like carbohydrate, actually not all fat is created equal either. Uh, so since essential fat cannot be made by the body, it must come from an external source. Uh, so typically when the patient's on TPN, that external source is the IV lipid. Um, but uh, some patients don't tolerate IV lipids, so not everybody ends up on IV lipid. And then just in thinking forward um, with the hope that these patients are going to decrease their TPN requirements over time, uh, we want to be making them aware of where to get uh, essential fat in their diet so that they can start eating fat um, in small amounts uh, really from the beginning. Um, and although they may and will likely be more sensitive to the fat, uh, taking it in small amounts um, throughout the day is going to be an important strategy in order for them to get essential fats um, over the long term and be able to absorb some of it. We know they're going to malabsorb some of it as well, um, but we want to be choosy with the fat and be sure that the essential fats are being included. And um, this also can be really handy in time of, of lipid lipid IV lipid shortages as well, um, because patients that have the ability to eat can be steered towards their essential fats um, to avoid deficiency. Okay, so now I want to talk about medication management. So antidiarrheals and antisecretories are considered conventional therapy, um, and the goal of these medications is to control output. So the number one symptom of, of short bowel is diarrhea, and these uh, two medications are used um, for the purposes of controlling output. So let's um, start first by talking about antidiarrheals. So the function of an antidiarrheal is used to increase intestinal transit time. Um, by that, specifically, we're trying to slow down the GI tract uh, to increase absorption of nutrients. Uh, so um, there are several types of uh, antidiarrheals, um, and the first two, both loperamide and diphenoxalate, are considered first-line therapy. These are anti-peristaltics. Anti they act by slowing intestinal motility and by affecting water and electrolyte movement um, through the bowel. Uh, the low pyramide doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, so it has um, little to no uh, central nervous system effects. Uh, the diphenoxalate does, um, but it has atropine um, in it to sort of prevent uh, there being any um, overuse of the product. Uh, and these, again, are considered first-line therapies, things that you want to be fully maximizing um, before thinking of the next line of treatment, which are our narcotics. Um, so for codeine, for example, um, uh, you know, obtained from opium or prepared from morphine, it, um, is a narcotic which depresses the central nervous system, but it does have an effect in slowing down the bowel. So what we tend to find is, is after the first, you know, if if after maximizing uh, the loperamide and the diphenoxalate, there isn't adequate uh, coverage and the patient is still having high stool frequency and uh, output, the narcotics are um, considered uh, in, in patients. In terms of dose, um, the dose really does vary depending on bowel anatomy and the volume and frequency of output, but just keeping in mind that the dose may exceed package dosing. Um, specifically, we see that with the loperamide because it enters the enterohepatic circulation, um, which is disrupted in short bowel patients that don't have an ileum. So those patients may need a higher dose. So, so don't be surprised by a higher dose. Certainly we always um, you know, have the patients working with a physician for medication dosing and adjustments, um, but it's just important to highlight uh, that uh, these medications uh, need to be used in conjunction with the diet um, manipulations. 
And in terms of best practices, the antidiarrheal should be taken 30 minutes prior to meals uh, for maximal effect. And although liquid medications are often thought of as being better absorbed, we just need to be careful um, that if that is the route chosen, that the um, sorbitol or sugar alcohols are being avoided um, so that, there is, that the antidiarrheal is not actually causing diarrhea uh, due to the, the sorbitol content. Okay, next are the anti-secretories. Um, these are used to decrease um, stomach acid secretion, um, which is increased after bowel resection. So normally, stomach acid is secreted in response to food, um, and, and it shuts off after the, the food leaves the stomach and enters the, sh the small bowel. Um, but this signaling is affected when the small bowel is resected. So oftentimes, uh, the stomach acid turns on and, and doesn't turn off. And it doesn't necessarily mean the patient's feeling heartburn. It just could mean that they're having higher output as a result of over secretion of acid. So this is another medication that's considered, you know, standard therapy um, and really um, should be, um, you know, implemented uh, from the get-go. Uh, so the two types of, of um, Anti-secretories are our H2 blockers and our proton pump inhibitors. An H2 blocker is a histamine H2 receptor antagonist. Um, it just means it inhibits both acid concentration and the volume of acid secretion. Um, examples uh, here are thimotidine and ranitidine. Um, both of these can be safely added to the TPN at home um, if those are um, medications that are, are utilized in the intravenous route. Um, proton pump inhibitors block the final step of acid production. So these are um, medications like omeprazole, um, esmeprazole, um, and pentoprazole. So these are, um, these are medications that are often chosen to be sort of the preferred um, the H2 antagonists, I'm sorry, the proton pump inhibitors tend to be the, the medication of choice. Um, however, they don't can't be added to TPN, uh, so have you know require a separate IV mix. So we don't often see them being used in home TPN patients for that reason. Um, dosing can be uh, should be daily and can be up to two times daily. And we often see patients on a combination of both. For example, they may be getting a form of uh, an IV uh, famotidine or ranitidine in their TPN. Um, at night if they're doing nocturnal uh, TPN, uh, which they probably are doing if they're successfully home on therapy. And um, during the day, an oral anti-secretory can be utilized in order to cover them for the full 24 hours. Um, so in terms of best practices, these medications are usually necessary after significant small bowel resection for up to six months, um, but can be longer. Uh, so the best way of knowing if whether they need the medication long term, you know, after that six month mark is to have them trial off of it and monitor stool volume uh, and frequency to determine, you know, if there's a continuing need. Um, I have to say that many patients um, continue to require the medication uh, for longer than six months. Um, and again, it's long term use is just so individual based on symptoms and underlying disease process. So it's important to take a take a look at it. Um, on an ongoing basis to see if the medication is still necessary. So additional medications to consider after these first-line therapies, like I said, really wanting to be sure you're maximizing antidiarrheals and antisecretories. This other category of medication, each of these medications can be considered in short bowel patients, um, but are not necessarily needed. So we're going to talk about their individual circumstances and when you may decide that this is a therapy that you want to pursue. So, for example, octreotide. Uh, this is an anti-secretory as well, um, but it is used specifically for patients um, that have a secretory component to their diarrhea, meaning usually short bowel patients have um, diarrhea due to the osmotic effects of food and fluid. Uh, secretory diarrhea is defined as somebody that is having diarrhea irregardless of eating and drinking. So our best way of knowing that is making the patient NPO and measuring their output. 
uh, for a, a period of 24 hours. And typically, if the output is greater than 800 mLs in a 24-hour period without eating and drinking, that is considered to be high and the patient is, is considered a candidate for an octreotide therapy. The reason we don't jump to it is octreotide can in, actually inhibit some of um, bowel adaptation. So we really like to reserve it for those that are, are exhibiting secretory diarrhea. And most short bowel patients are not exhibiting uh, secretory diarrhea. Again, it's the diarrhea is due to the osmotic effects of food and fluid. Uh, next, uh, cholestyramine it can be used. Um, this is specifically, it's a bile salt binder. And I mentioned that bile salts get malabsorbed in this patient population. But if the patient's ileal resection um, is less than 100 centimeters, we actually recommend trialing cholestyramine because these patients are going to continuously malabsorb bile salts and the cholestyramine can be helpful. For patients that have of greater than 100 centimeters of small bowel or ileum removed, um, eventually this bile salt pool gets depleted. So the medication may be needed initially, but not over the long term, because as you can imagine, to, to sort of meet the definition of a short bowel patient, most short bowel patients have had more than 100 centimeters of their ileum resected. So again, there may be a role for this medication, but possibly only for a short term. And again, you're going to want to make sure you're evaluating whether the medication is helpful. This is a powder that has to be mixed in fluid um, and can have some negative effects. Um, and if it's not benefiting the patients, one of the negative effects we see is sometimes it's binding up um, other medications and or some of um, the supplements that they're taking, fat soluble supplements in particular. So just wanting to be sure that you're careful about whether the patient needs it. Uh, next is antibiotics. Um, these, this is often used to treat bacterial overgrowth. Uh, remember, we talked about colonic fermentation and the great benefit that that um, provides to patients via the colon. Uh, the trouble with that is sometimes um, colonic fermentation can get a little out of control. Uh, and so that bacteria that's, you know, or that carbohydrate that's getting malabsorbed into the colon and the colon is feeding on that bacteria, all that all in the wild, that's good to create, you know, a source of energy and, and make up for some of the calories that are, would have otherwise been lost. Sometimes this balance of fermentation gets a little out of control and the bacteria grow uh, to, to be too much. And that results in chronic gas and bloating for the patient can result in uh, higher stool volume, as well as it can interfere with, with oral intake. So uh, identifying patients that have symptoms like this and treating with antibiotics is important in order to move on from those symptoms and get back to a baseline um, so that uh, there, there may be a role for that specifically for patients with a colon. And then finally, pancreatic enzymes. This um, certainly, short bowel is a condition of malabsorption, not maldigestion, um, but uh, rapid transit does not always allow food and enzymes to mix um, the way they should up in the duodenal area. Uh, so there are uh, some patients that benefit from the use of pancreatic enzymes to help um, break down food um, if this process is not being, um, you know, kind of coordinated correctly within the, the GI tract. So we don't start typically with pancreatic enzymes, but if somebody's um, stool output is not improving, um, you know, it's a, it, it can be a consideration. So just want to be sure that you're aware of that as well. Okay. So we've talked about, you know, medications as they relate um, specifically to symptom management. Uh, and now what I just want to speak a, a bit on is looking at um, growth factors, because growth factors are specialized treatments aimed at actually changing the function of the remaining small bowel. So we've talked about medications that treat symptoms, and here we're going to actually talk about uh, medications that change function. So uh, the first uh, that we're going to speak of is um, somatotropin. Um, it it is a recombinant analog of somatotropin, or somatotropin is a recombinant analog of somatotropin, which is human growth hormone, um, which is an anabolic agent that interacts with specific receptors on a variety of cells, including the intestinal lining, 
So the actions of somatropin on the intestine may be direct or mediated through the production of insulin-like growth factor 1 or IGF-1. Um, treatment with somatropin has been shown to enhance intestinal transport of water, electrolytes, and nutrients. So what has the research results to date shown? So a randomized, double-blind, um, placebo-controlled study of 41 patients conducted um, back at the Nutritional Restart Center by uh, Dr. Byrne um, and colleagues showed that patients received growth hormone with or without glutamine and diet um, experienced a significantly greater reduction in PN volume, calories, and infusions per week. So this uh, research led to the FDA approval of somatropin in 2005, and this uh, continues uh, to remain on the market today. Next is tadouglutide. Um, this is a recombinant analog of human glucagon-like peptide 2, a protein involved in the rehabilitation of the intestinal lining. Um, Tadouglutide improves intestinal rehabilitation by promoting mucosal growth and possibly by restoring gastric emptying and secretion. So just want to focus on that promoting mucosal growth. Again, where before we were symptom managing and now a treatment like this could potentially enhance the growth of the, of the remaining tissue. Um, treatment with tadouglutide is associated with enhancement or re restoration of the structural and functional integrity of the remaining intestine. Um, helping to improve absorption and reduce parenteral nutrition needs. So what has the research uh, results to date shown? Um, in a multinational, multi-center, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, parallel group, two-stage, phase three study um, conducted by Jepson and his colleagues, patients who received tadouglutide experienced a significant reduction in PN volume and number of infusion days per week. Um, and this led to the FDA approval of tadouglutide in 2012. Now, there are other medications currently under investigation, um, including um, these I'm not the best at saying, um, but glutide. Um, and this is a uh, medication that is uh, longer acting. Um, so uh, once, once weekly dosing, and then the next medication, um, I'm not even gonna actually try to say it because I don't feel like I say it well, um, but this is also looking at longer acting um, this uh, drug therapy as well. So the um, tadouglutide that I spoke of is daily dosing, um, whereas these medications that are be currently being investigated are less frequently than that, um, often weekly dosing. And then there is this DPP4 inhibitor under investigation, as well as combinations of GLP-1 and GLP-2 um, being looked at as well. So I feel like this continues to be a great area of focus and one that is exciting and, you know, and hopeful um, for the short bowel population. And in terms of surgical evaluation, so there are non-transplant surgical procedures used to augment the remaining bowel. Um, so examples of that, like reconnecting sections of bowel that are not in circuit, sometimes, um, oftentimes, the surgeries that are done on these patients um, are emergency surgeries, especially in the cases of those with infarctions. And so there is sometimes some colon left in uh, out of circuit that um, can be reconnected uh, and, you know, Patients don't always know that that bowel is there, um, and sometimes surgeons aren't jumping to reconnect it because the patient has gone through a lot through their initial surgery. So we always want to identify if there's any bowel, and that is first and foremost, if it can be reconnected, ideally you want it reconnected. And if they're not with a team that is comfortable um, or sees a lot of you know, this type of, of surgery, it's really important to reroute and help reroute the patient to a center that is very comfortable reconnecting because this can be an incredible game changer for a patient. Just for all the reasons that we spoke about related to the colon, it's important if colon is there to get it back in circuit. Um, there are procedures used um, to dilate, um, use, that are used, um, uh, the dilated segments of bowel are used to lengthen remaining bowel. Uh, so that's a strategy um, that is often used. We see it used uh, more often in children than in adults, but we do see it used, utilized in adults as well. And then um, strictureplasty to dilate narrowed areas to alleviate recurrent obstructions to make, you know, to allow the patient to better um, tolerate uh, their oral diet, um, because of course the oral diet is key in promoting uh, absorption and being able to eventually wean um, from 
from some or all of the parental nutrition. Um, and then, of course, I'm not going to talk about um, intestinal transplant, um, but that is reserved for patients that um, have um, complications from long-term parental nutrition um, that, you know, either they're running out of IV access, uh, they may be having uh, liver involvement uh, that is impairing their, you know, ongoing um, ability to tolerate TPN. Um, so it's important that early referrals to transplant centers um, occur so that they're on the radar screen of these of these teams. And again, they may not need transplant ever, um, but it's important to have them evaluated. Um, and you know, in the same center, they're often able to receive the intestinal rehabilitation um, and, like I said, may never need to pursue transplantation, but getting them into and under the care of a team that's highly proficient in the care of these patients is, is important. So in my last couple of slides, I'm just going to just talk through um, acute versus chronic management of these patients, just to highlight um, this concept a little bit further of just, you know, sort of how to approach a short bowel patient. Um, so first in the acute phase, you're thinking about, of course, aggressively repleting fluid and electrolytes. Um, PN should initially be used to meet calorie and nutrient requirements. Um, luminal nutrition should be initiated as soon as possible. So we're, we're wanting that ideally to be through diet. Um, but if diet is not possible, um, you know, utilizing um, enteral formulations uh, is, is also uh, a very good idea. Um, Ideally, a polymeric isotonic liquid formula should be trialed, um, thinking that just like food uh, being a, a stimulant for the GI tract, uh, the having an intact formula versus an elemental formula would is is far more ideal. Um, the sooner, the better in terms of beginning the adaptation process that we spoke of. Um, Oral rehydration solution should be trialed and really emphasized in order for patients to have uh, the best uh, outcome in terms of uh, their, their fluid tolerance, limiting stool volume, and protecting their kidneys over the long term. Um, so much emphasis um, should be placed on these oral rehydration solutions in this acute period. Um, and anti-motility agents should be initiated and anti-secretory agents should be used, as I mentioned already, due to acid hypersecretion. Uh, so these patients stay in this phase for quite some time, and these are the things that should be the focus. Um, but as they move into the long term, you're going to be wanting to think about, um, well, always minimizing catheter-related complications, um, avoiding liver and kidney dysfunction. So you know the reasons why we're being careful about the TPN and focusing on hydration is to minimize, you know, secondary, secondary organ dysfunction um, as a result of, um, you know, the, the complications of short bowel. Um, you want to manage, excuse me, manage metabolic bone disease. Um, so being careful about, um, you know, making sure they're getting enough calcium uh, and taking, you know, good look at um, their vitamin D levels and making early referrals to um, endocrinologists that specialize in bone health so that they can be getting their um, bone density testing. Um, we want to be sure that we're addressing micronutrient deficiencies, uh, and that is on an ongoing basis. So at a minimum, these patients are getting annual micronutrients, um, but more likely every six months um, in the beginning. And if they are completely weaned off of TPN, you're going to want to be continuing to check those micronutrients over the long term. Um, as I previously highlighted, uh, you want to be sure you're treating bacterial overgrowth um, for those that are, um, you know, suffering from the, those symptoms. Um, and you do want to address the quality of life disruptions. Um, there are so many. Um, the sleep disruptions are significant. Um, you know, the, the, the amount of time in the bathroom, uh, the, the fear of leaving home. So anything you can do to help with the symptoms um, is going to greatly impact these patients' quality of life. And of course, any type of weaning of parental nutrition can greatly um, impact um, the quality of life of these patients. And so that's, you know, that's the end game. That's what we're trying to promote with all of these strategies.
So in summary, um, intestinal rehabilitation is a stepwise approach, um, but the therapies are often used simultaneously. Uh, remaining bowel anatomy will determine short bowel severity and will provide the blueprint for PN weaning potential. Um, care must be individualized and patient motivation and participation are key. And of course, you know, hearing all those diet recommendations and the thought of oral rehydration solutions, it's like you've got to have the patient on board and invested in the process in order to make headway um, in, the, in the weaning. And close monitoring throughout the adaptive process helps to ensure long-term success. So with that, um, I will um, answer questions. All right, thank you, Maria. We do have one question, um, and that Here. is what is, the, what is the optimal duration of octreotide? Sure, it's a great question. Um, I really, it's really dependent upon symptoms. Um, you know, ideally, if it's not showing, you know, improvements uh, in symptoms, then it's not something that you're going to want the patient to stay on um, because it can interfere with adaptation. Um, so, and it could be a transient issue too with over secretion of, of these acids. So, if it's something that they're demonstrating early on, they may only need it. For a period of time and then you know be able to move over to more standard therapy which is the the promotidine and the anti-secretory uh management uh both in in the tpn and outside of the tpn all right thank you i think that is all if there are no other questions no other questions okay well if they come up later or i'm happy to you know answer them via email. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to join you all today and, and thank you uh, for having me. Yeah, thank you.